This presentation is on one of our special senses, and that is vision. Uh, this information can be found in Chapter 13 of your textbook on pages 239 to 249. So how do we see? In a nutshell, light enters both of our eyes and excites receptors that are located at the back of each eyeball. And these receptors are part of a neural pathway that takes this information from those receptors all the way back to the back of our brain where our visual cortex is located. And that image then is interpreted by our brain. Ultimately, being able to see images in our environment requires this entire pathway to be functioning, right from the receptors being receptive or stimulated by that light being able to transmit that, ele that in electrical information to the brain and the brain being functional and able to interpret that, those images. If there's any part of this pathway that's not functioning properly, then that will lead to visual impairment. So right now, what I would like you to do is take a look at this slide and I would like you to focus on the line between the fish and the apple images, right in the center. Okay, this establishes what we call our fields of view. So as you're looking straight ahead, everything that is in the right part of your vision, that's what we call our right field of view, and everything in the left part of the vision, that's our left field of view. So ultimately the fish is in our right field of view and the apple is in our left field of view. Light coming from the fish right now is entering both of our eyes. It is entering the right side of our left eye and the right side of our right eye. And that light then is being transmitted from both eyes back to the left visual cortex. The same in the same manner, the light that is coming from the apple is coming in through both eyes through the left part of our left eye and the left part of our right eye. And that information is being transmitted from both eyes to our right visual cortex. So we do get information from both fields of view in both eyes. Um, information from the right field of view ends up in the left part of our brain and vice versa. The optic chiasm is the place where the fibers in these pathways cross. The big nerves that take information from our left and right eyes back to the visual cortex are called the optic nerve. So ultimately, though, when we're looking out into space, our left and right eyes see different images. And our brain puts both of those images together. And that allows us to perceive depth. So for example, if you do a quick exercise, if you hold up two pencils in front of you, one in each hand, uh, facing each other horizontally at arm's length, and then with one eye closed, try to touch the end of the pencils together. And then try with uh, the other eye closed, and then try with both eyes open. So without going really, really slowly and making adjustments, it should be that it would be much easier to do with both eyes open. And that's because each eye looks at the image from a slightly different angle, and that allows us to perceive depth, and we don't miss the ends in front of us. So give that a quick try. Okay, so if we take a close look at the eyeball and what happens when light enters the eye, we have to do a little bit of anatomy. So if we look at our eyeball, this is the front of the eye. And the part that covers the front of the eye is called the cornea. And the cornea is a clear surface, uh, clear tissue. And its main job is to allow light to come through it. And because it's a different density than air, it is going to bend the light a little bit. 
kind of like if you stick a stick in the water and you look at the stick, the stick looks like it's bending. And that's because the light is being bent as it hits a different density. So as it goes from air into water, the light bends and it makes the image feel uh, appear bent. Um, that's similar to when light goes from the air through the cornea. Light is going to be bent, and the way it gets bent is, is if light is coming straight in towards the cornea, it is going to be bent in towards the center of the eyeball, and that's an important, as we'll see in just a bit. Uh, the white part of the eye, which is from the side, is this part, top and bottom, and if we take a look directly on the eye, it's this white part around the edge. That is called the sclera, and its job is mainly supportive. It supports and protects the eyeball. Uh, <coughs> the ciliary muscles, which are these little muscles here, they hold the lens. Now the lens is the consistency of, of kind of uh, hardened jello, jelly. And so it does have flexibility. And when these muscles contract, when the ciliary muscles contract, it causes the lens to bend slightly. And of course, the lens's job is to allow light to go through it, and it can bend the light, and hopefully bend the light in enough, um, in a manner such that we can focus the image, so we can get the image clear and in focus. The color part of the eye, this is called the iris. And the iris is a big muscle. And the muscle allows the, us to change the amount of light that comes into the eye. The pupil, which is seen head on as this black portion, is really just a hole. It's not a structure in itself. And what we're doing when we look into the pupil, it's a little bit creepy, is that we're just looking right into the back of the eyeball. So this uh, iris acts like a diaphragm, and it can uh, dilate the pupil, meaning make the hole bigger and allow more light into the eye, or it can constrict and allow less light into the eye. So ultimately, if the, if the cornea wasn't in place, you'd be able to stick a pin or something like that right through that hole, and you'd be able to touch the lens. Don't try that at home. Uh, so. Um, the lens's job is to bend the light so that the light, as it's coming in in straight lines, bends a little bit with the cornea and bends with the lens to come to a focal point to focus the image on the back of the eyeball. And on the back of the eyeball, that is a, a membrane that contains uh, photoreceptors, and these are special receptors that respond to and get excited by light. So when light hits them, they get excited and they generate action potentials. So that's the job of the retina. It contains those photoreceptors. The axons from all these receptors all come together and they leave the eyeball in a big nerve that we call the optic nerve, and that's going to head back towards the visual cortex. Um, we also have uh, muscles that are voluntary, and these um, can move the eyeball around so that we can shift our gaze you know, to the side or up or down, and so we can move our eyeballs independently of our head. And our extrinsic eye muscles, uh, when we're born, are not coordinated, and so as a result, disturbingly enough, when I looked at my newborn baby and one eye went in one direction and the other in the other direction, that was totally normal. But as our visual system develops after birth, those eye muscles become coordinated, and so that now, if we move one eye in one direction, the other automatically follows to focus on that same image. The eye needs to be kept moist, and it needs to be kept clear of debris, and that's the job of the lacrimal gland, which is this gland that's located uh, right above uh, the eye, and it produces tears. And these tears flow 
uh, over the eye and then down into the tear ducts and then into the tear sac and then ultimately into the nasal cavity. This is the close-up um, picture of the lacrimal gland and this is a tear that's being produced and it does this constantly to bathe and to keep the eyes moist and to wash away any debris. Um, because tears end up flowing into our nasal cavity, that's why your nose always gets stuffed up when you cry, and it's because you're just the, filling your nasal cavity full of tears. Just by the way, babies cry but can't produce tears until they're at least two weeks old. So that's another part of the visual system that takes a while to develop after birth. Okay, star, star, star. The key to being able to see things in focus is being able to bend light in a particular way to stimulate your uh, photoreceptors in a particular way. So light travels in straight lines until it hits an object that's a different density. So here we have light coming in towards um, the eye. It hits the cornea, and as it hits the cornea, it's slightly bent inward, starting to then um, bend those rays of light towards a single point. Um, the job of the lens is to further bend the light enough so that the, the light rays that are coming into the eye um, will come to a single point just at the moment when it hits the back of the retina. If the light is bent too much and the light comes to a single point somewhere in the middle of the eyeball, then, of course, light's going to continue in that direction, and by the time it hits the retina, then it's not going to be at a single point, and the image that we're seeing will be out of focus. Just by the way, the eyeball itself is filled with fluid, and so light still travels through this fluid as it's heading towards the back of the eye. Um, if the light isn't bent enough, then it's still going to be uh, very diffuse or not at a single point when it hits the back of the retina and again the image won't be in focus. So in normal vision light is bent using the muscles that will bend the lens and squish the lens and make it bulge um, or flatten it and uh, light is bent by the cornea and the lens enough so that it comes to a single point at the back of the retina. Um, we have a particular spot on the ref retina that contains cells that allow us to see things in a lot of details. And that is called the fovea, or macula. And that's one particular point um, on the retina. And when we want to look at an image in as much detail as we can, we turn our eyes and bend the light such that it comes to a focal point exactly on that spot. And that allows us to have the clearest detailed vision. So when the cells in the retina then get excited, they start to send action potentials down their axons, and those axons all leave the eye through the optic nerve. We call the point where light comes to a single point after it's bent, we call that the focal plane. And again, to see things clearly, the focal plane should be exactly at the point of the back of the eyeball, right on the retina. Okay, so what I would like you to do is I would like you to stare out into space, past your computer screen. Stare out and let your eyes look as far as they possibly can. So to the far side of a room or out a window. As you're looking out into space as far as you can, your ciliary muscles, the muscles that are attached to your lens, are totally relaxed. They are as relaxed as they possibly can. And your lens is as flat as it possibly can be. It's a very thin lens. And that allows us to see things uh, and focus things that are in the distance. So if you have 20-20 vision and you're looking out far, far away, things should be in focus. They may get to a point where they're too far to see in detail, but they should be in focus, they're not blurry. Um, or if you are wearing corrective lenses that are working properly, same deal. So now what I want you to do is focus at your computer screen. 
Okay, as you're focusing at your computer screen, your ciliary muscles have had to contract in order to bend the light more to keep that focal plane right at the back of your retina. So your lens is bulging a little bit, and as the lens bulges, it allows the, bent, the light to be bent a little bit more. Now I want you to take your finger and hold it at arm's length in front of your nose. Now your ciliary muscles are even more contracted and the lens is bulging even more and the lens light is being bent even more just to keep it in focus. And as you move your finger in towards your nose and stop and allow your eyes to adjust, then your ciliary muscles become more and more contracted, your lens bulges even more, and the light is bent as much as it can until you reach a point where you can't bend the light enough to keep it in focus, and then the image becomes blurry. So if you have 20-20 vision, and you are staring out as far as you can and your lens is totally relaxed, the light should be bent such that it comes to a focal point right on your retina. If you look at distant objects and they are blurry, it means that you can't bring that light to a focal point right at the retina. That is called myopia or nearsightedness, meaning that you can focus objects when they are near, but you can't have distant objects in focus. And that means that the light is being bent too quickly. And so as a result, it's coming to a focal point uh, in front or before it actually hits the retina. And then as light continues in straight lines, then it becomes diffuse and that's why the image is blurry. So this could be a number of reasons why this occurs. It could be that the cornea is too, um, uh, bulgy, it's too curved, and the more curved it is, the more it's going to bend the light. It could be that the lens is too curved, it's too strong, and it's bending the light too quickly as well. Or it could be that your eyeball shape is long, the eyeball is too long, and even though the lens and cornea are working properly, um, because the photoreceptors are way back here, the focal point is in front of the retina. So for those people that um, have never experienced myopia or nearsightedness, uh, this is kind of what the image would look like, where objects, the closer that they get, the more in focus that they are, and the further away they get, the more blurry it becomes. Hyperopia or farsightedness is the exact opposite. People that have hyperopia can uh, focus things that are in the distance, but they can't focus things when they are up close. And uh, this could be because the uh, uh, eyeball is too short. Um, it could have to do with the shape of the cornea being too flat. A very common cause of hyperopia is age. And as people get older, the lens becomes stiffer and stiffer. And so it can't bulge when things come close. Uh, it can't change its shape enough to bend the light. And so the light, even though the eyeball is trying to bend the light as quickly as it can, it can't. And as a result, the focal plane is somewhere behind the retina. And it's not at a point when, when it hits the back of the eyeball. Um, just by the way, if you are myopic now and you feel that somehow that uh, as you get older that, that the hyperopia that develops will cancel it out. It doesn't really work that way. If you're myopic, it means that you can't see things in the distance and that will always be the same. And, and as you get older and your lens gets stiffer, it means that now you will also not be able to focus things that are up close. So they two kind of get added together. There's no canceling out effect. Just by the way, when we talk about 2020 vision, what we're saying is, and that's what we consider normal vision, we're saying that you were able to see 20 feet what a person with normal vision sees at 20 feet. If we say your vision is <coughs> excuse me, 2040, 
it means that you're able to see at 20 feet what a person with normal vision sees at 40 feet. So that's less vision. This is what a person with farsightedness or hyperopia um, sees. And so you can see that images that are in the background are much more in focus than objects that are up close. In addition to the, those two refractive errors, so refractive meaning errors in bending the light, um, there's some people also have what's called an astigmatism. And this is caused when there are unequal curves in different parts of the lens or in different parts of the cornea. And as a result, light entering different sections of the lens or cornea gets bent at different rates. And so the light isn't focused to a single point, but at a couple of points or multiple points on the back of the, the eyeball. So vision with an astigmatism is blurry, but it's almost got kind of a skewed um, quality to it. It's not just blurry. Uh, the images feel seem like they've been smeared. Stars are star. So strabismus is caused, this is a, a, an extrinsic eye muscle issue. So this is um, an issue not with the functioning of light entering the eye, but with the muscles that are controlling the eyeballs. And if you remember, we have these muscles and the muscles go all around the eyeballs. So they're at the top, the sides, the bottom. And um, if, there, if there's unequal pull in two different eyes, then um, a person, a child, can't coordinate the movement of those two eyes. And if that's the case, then the two eyes are not focused on the same image. And, um, and so uh, it ends up creating um, a different perspective. Um, it's important to correct because the visual cortex is still developing right after birth and the brain may stop recognizing signals from the eye that deviates and that can cause blindness in that eye. So in an experiment a, quite a long time ago, um, kittens that had one eye patched at birth, they become functionally blind. So even though the eyeball is functioning, the lens is working, the cornea is fine, the retina is fine, um, but they're functionally blind because their visual cortex didn't receive normal visual input in order to create the brain pathways that are necessary for us to interpret those signals. So strabismus is very important to correct early on. Um, there's an increased risk for children with cerebral palsy because they already have difficulties controlling those voluntary muscles. A um, couple options. Um, Sometimes they will cover or patch the stronger eye for periods of time during the day. It's not all the time, but just periods of time. And that forces the weaker muscles in the deviating eye to become stronger. This is sometimes hard to get kids to do. There's only so much that talking about being a pirate will encourage them to wear the patch. Um, often what they will do is surgery. And what they'll do is they'll clip the muscle fibers on the strong side on the side that's pulling and and that's in order to make the eye muscles on both sides of the eye equal strength um, so and they do this sometimes in little bits they'll do it one surgical technique or though you do one surgery and and clip them a little bit and see how that works uh, so that they don't clip too much all at one time so the type of receptors that are found at the that respond to light and that are found at the back of the retina are called photoreceptors. And they are found all over the retina except at the point where all the axons from these receptors gather and leave the eyeball. So where the optic nerve exits. So t theoretically, this is a blind spot for us. There's no photoreceptors. But if you stare out into space and try to locate where your blind spot is, you can't. And that's because your brain just patches in. It's like photoshopping over top of that blind spot. So it interprets it, the view as having no black or blank spots. This picture here is a really cool one. This is, um, this is the, where the optic nerve uh, exits the eyeball. And as you can see, there's no blind spots there. There's a neat um, blind spot 
uh, demo so you can trick your brain into being able to see the blind spot and um, uh, we'll do that in class. At the back of our eyeball we have two types of photoreceptors. We have rod cells, which are these gray ones in this picture, and we have cone cells, which are the purple ones in this picture. The two types of cells have different roles, and they're located uh, primarily in different parts of the eye. So our rod cells are mostly located outside of the fovea, so in the edge of the retina, less so in the center of the retina. And so we use these rod cells for our peripheral, peripheral vision. So if you look out straight ahead, all of the information you see in the periphery, that is all information or light that is being directed onto our rod cells. Rod cells have a superpower in that they are able to respond even with very, very low levels of light. So whenever we want to see a really faint star, um, we have to put it in our peripheral vision. If you're looking up at a very faint star and you notice it in the periphery, if you look right at it, the star disappears. And that's because in order to see that little low levels of light, you have to direct that light into your peripheral vision. Um, rod cells don't provide good visual details. And so if you are looking directly at something, you can see the details there, but then the details as we go out into our peripheral vision get less and less and less. You notice that there's images there, but we can't make them out in the same way as if we look directly at them. So if we have uh, anything that interferes with the function of our rod cells, for example, vitamin A deficiency, or if those rod cells start to degenerate, then we, a person has what we call night blindness. And this is that they can see just fine when there's lots of light, but when we're in low light conditions, then, then they have a, a really difficult time seeing. And so this is what somebody with night blindness would see in the darkness. So they can see headlights, and, and, but uh, images that are in low levels of light disappear. The other thing that can happen with degeneration of rod cells is a loss of our peripheral vision, our tunnel vision. So a person can see when they're looking right at something, but everything in the periphery is blurred. The other type of cells are called cone cells. And we have three different cone types that respond to different types of light. Most of our cone cells are located in the center of the retina, in, right in that fovea region. And whenever we want to see something in details, we look directly at it, and uh, that focuses the light right on our cone cells, right at the fovea, and we get our highest um, amount of details, so our highest visual acuity by looking directly at something and focusing the light on our cone cells. They need lots of light in order to be able to be stimulated, and so they don't respond well in low-level light conditions. Um, but we have three different types of cones that respond to different wavelengths, and so we have uh, an ability to see color. So we have blue cones, green cones, and red cones, and stimulating different wavelengths will uh, stimulate different numbers of each of the cones, and we can perceive color. A person that is colorblind is missing one or more of these cone types, and it's caused by a recessive gene on the X chromosome, and because it's an X-linked genetic disorder, an X-linked recessive disorder, it occurs almost exclusively in males. If we lose our cone cells, then we lose our center vision, and um, this is what that image would look like. Sometimes this is called uh, macular degeneration, so degeneration of the macula or the fovea, those cone cells right in the center. So this is what um, an ophthalmologist sees when they look through that little thing, you put your chin on the chin rest and they look back into the eye. You can see the image of the retina. And um, so this is an optometrist or an ophthalmologist that's looking through an ophthalmoscope. And we can see the back of the retina. This is a healthy retina. This is the spot where the optic nerve leaves the, um, leaves the eyeball. 
and this is the fovea, so this is the point where all the cone cells are located, and then rod cells would be located all around here. So an optometrist or an ophthalmologist can look at the retina, see if it's healthy, is there any areas that are degenerating, is it still attached to the back of the eyeball, uh, what does the optic nerve look like, uh, what do blood vessels back there, is tissue getting lots of um, nutrients and oxygen supply. A cataract um, occurs when there's a problem with the lens, and the lens itself becomes very hard, so difficult to, to bend, and opaque. So it's not clear, and so light coming through it is very hazy, and that creates a very hazy vision. So cataracts can develop um, as a, a matter of age, so as people get older, the lens gets older. Um, measles during pregnancy can cause cataracts to form in newborn infants. There's an increased risk uh, for persons with Down syndrome of developing cataracts. Now the best treatment for cataracts is surgery to replace the lens. So they just go in, takes them maybe 15-20 minutes, the surgery is really quick, um, and they can go in, take out the old lens, and put in a new lens implant. Um, and Although you won't be able to bulge that lens, what they usually do is they put a lens in one eye to see near objects and a lens in the other eye to see far objects. And your brain is able to take both those images and create um, you know, sight in both near and far and distance. This is what vision with cataracts would look like. Um, so very, very hazy. It's like looking through uh, a bath, a shower wall of that kind of opaque um, shower wall. So I would like you to take a look in your textbook and read about some other causes of visual disorders. So remember that anything that affects anywhere along that pathway could cause a, a visual impairment. So things like glaucoma where there's an increase of pressure of the fluid inside the eyeball can affect vision. Um, diabetes can affect vision because it, it can af uh, affect the health of blood vessels that are supplying nutrients to the eye and, uh, and as a result can cause parts of the retina to start to degenerate. So we can see diabetic retinopathy. So here, if we, if we look at the image of uh, the retina, we can see areas of the retina where blood vessels have burst, and we can see degeneration in the area of the fovea. And that's that as a result of damage to blood vessels in the eye. And this is what the vision would like, look like associated with that. This is what vision with glaucoma may look like, and this is just due to increased pressure in the fluid inside the eyeball. Um, visual impairments can be caused by damage or lack of function of the optic nerve or damage to the brain to the visual cortex itself, such as a, a with acquired brain injury. Okay, this is the end of the vision section of special senses, and uh, there will be a, two other sections that we're going to talk about, one uh, for hearing and balance and the other for taste and smell.